Hey, Jenny, how are you? Hello, one and all. This is Pastor Lane. We are getting ready to start our catechism study again tonight, but we're going to give folks just a minute or two to see that the live stream is up so that they can jump in and join us. So please have a little bit of patience as we do this together and spend a little time in study. If you hear some noise in the background, this is coming from my home. And I have a family, and they happen to just be finishing up supper. So we um, ask your patience as they're finishing that up. So thank you very much. Hope you're all doing well. Got a few more folks. Oh, this is fabulous. We are getting ready to go. And hello to one and all. I am Pastor Lane Nelson, pastor at Eastside Lutheran Church. I'm so glad you are here as tonight we take a look at Luther's small catechism, specifically the Apostles' Creed. We have a chance to get together and spend just a couple of minutes. We have quite a few folks who are jumping in already. Hi, Judy and Helen and Colleen and Connie and Jenny and... Lots of folks, lots of folks. Diane, Janet, wonderful. This is proving to be a nice little way to connect with one another. Tonight, as I mentioned, we are in part two of our multi-part series at the Apostles' Creed, or at the Luther Small Catechism, looking at the Apostles' Creed. Tonight, we are just going to do a quick overview again of what the Small Catechism is very briefly, and then we'll talk a little bit about what creeds are. And then we will also look more in-depth at how Luther explains the three articles of the Apostles' Creed and what that might mean for us. But this is a um, kind of an open forum, if you will. So please post comments, post questions here on um, Facebook, and I will do my best to see your questions. I've asked my wife to pay attention so that the questions come up that I'm missing, so that she can then alert me to that, and then I can get them answered. My apologies if I do not get your question answered, um, but I will do my best. But as all good things should begin, why don't we begin tonight in prayer? Let us pray. God, we come to you this night from many different places and from many different places in our lives. We ask that you would be with us, that you would help us draw close to you, that you would lead us in our time together, and that you would meet us where we are at. May we learn more about you as you are expressed to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Again, welcome. I am Elaine Nelson, pastor at East Side at Lutheran Church. This study is looking at this little book. This is the copy I had. Um, it's dated 1979. It was my confirmation copy. This is a little newer version of Luther's Small Catechism. It's the one we use at Eastside with our confirmation students. It's the study edition, so there's a little bit more in this. Again, post your questions, post your comments, and we will go from here. So, the first thing to all of this, a quick overview, Luther's Small Catechism, what is it? Well, Luther's small catechism is really a, a, a teaching tool, if you will, um, on what it is we believe. It's, it's a study guide to help us understand the tenets of the Christian faith a little bit more, and specifically um, as Lutherans, how we understand them. There are catechisms from many different denominations, but the Lutheran one is specifically speaking to, to how we understand um, the important pieces of our faith. Some people use this as a prayer book. They look at it daily or they look at a piece of it and then meditate or think on that throughout the course of the day. So it can be a really helpful resource, a really helpful tool. Who is Martin Luther? Martin Luther, of course, was a monk, a priest, professor who had some um, ideas about the Bible that the church at the time, back in the late 1400s, early 1500s, 
um, didn't agree with, and eventually he got kicked out of the Roman Catholic Church because of his understanding of Scripture, and his teachings have lived on today some 500 years later, and they are the basis of what we think of as um, Lutheranism. Why did he write it? Luther wrote the small catechism because he went out and about and realized that the, the homes and the churches just did not have a good understanding of the basics of faith, and not even the pastors. And so he wanted to have a guide that parents could use in their homes to teach these important things that we might raise people of faith, so that we might have homes and communities that are grounded in God's Word. So it is a resource for us to use in the home, and also as a teaching tool for um, pastors. It was written in 1529, and the six core pieces of it, no matter which version, if you have um, our the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, talks about our two sacraments, Holy Baptism and Holy Communion, and then Confession. And so it kind of digs into them and goes a little bit deeper. Now, again, as I mentioned, many denominations have their own catechisms, um, but what makes this significant for us, what makes it distinctively Lutheran, is in the explanations. The catechism takes a question-answer form. It says, this is the first commandment. What does this mean? And then there's an explanation. It's in that explanation that we really have that Lutheran understanding, that Lutheran identity of, of who God is and how he's speaking to us. So, if you do not have one of these books with you, hopefully you do, but um, you can also get them free on your app store. Just go to there and look up Luther Small Catechism and download, and you can um, get those right on your phone or your tablet to have with you wherever you're at. Yes, there's a question. It's not so much a question. I think Jenny's mom is saying she can't hear you. She said turn up the volume. She said there was no volume. Hmm. So I think I that's going to be on your else. end because all I have for volume is coming in in a little device right here, so I apologize. You might just have to crank your volume up where you're at. Yeah, I had to turn mine Sorry up. about that. Okay, so tonight, as mentioned, we are looking at the Apostles' Creed. I think it is important to start out with that question, what is a creed? She says we have no sound. Hmm. No sound, huh? So let me see. I was having sound here earlier. Maybe no one's hearing me anywhere. Anybody besides Janet having problems hearing? Connie says you're cutting out on her end. It looks like we have volume coming through here on this device that's in front of me. Amber Ginter says she hears just fine. So it looks like it might be individually where you're at. So again, my apologies if you are struggling to hear. I will try and speak a little bit more directly into this device because this is where my microphone is going to be picking me up at. So hopefully that will help if I look more over this direction. There's others that say that they're good. Others are good with sound? All right. Well, if you see me smiling from time to time, that's because I have a little card in front of me um, that looks like this. Smile, Jesus loves you. And I found that on my desk again um, just tonight, and I thought I would bring that out here. I used to have several of these that I would hand out to people, um, but it made me smile today, and so I share it with you. And when you smile wherever you're at tonight, may it be a reminder that Jesus loves you as well. All right, back at it. A creed. What is a creed? Well, a creed, kind of simply stated, is nothing more than a statement of belief. Some people have their own personal creeds that speak about how they interpret life. Um, some groups will have a creed or a motto. Maybe you have your own um, creed that kind of dictates your own life. Um, but for us as Christians, creeds help define what we believe, and they also address certain questions that have come up about what we believe from others so that we can all kind of be about the same thing. A religious creed often addresses theological issues that people have or that have been the source of debate. 
And, and so our creed as Christians kind of sets us apart from people who are not Christian and the beliefs that they hold. In the Lutheran Church, we have three different creeds that we confess. These creeds are the Nicene, the Athanasian, and of course the Apostles' Creed, our focus tonight. The Nicene Creed was written back in 325 A.D., it was from the Council of Nicaea, which is in present-day Turkey, and it was called by Emperor Constantine at the time to help define what all of these sprouting up churches um, who were having little differing beliefs, um, what did they have in common and, and what held them together. And so these church leaders sat down and they came up with this creed at Nicaea, and so that is the Nicene Creed. The Athanasian Creed is another one. It dates back to the um, late 6th century. Traditionally, the Athanasian Creed was accredited to Athanasius, hence the name. Um, but we realize that it probably was not written by him, but kind of came out of his school of thought and some others. It's not my personal favorite of the three. I don't know if people have favorite creeds, but the Athanasian is not mine. We usually only use it in our liturgical church year um, one Sunday out of the year. Um, and last year, I apologize, we didn't even do that. And then we have, of course, the Apostles' Creed. Now, the Apostles' Creed, as its name tells us, expresses the faith of the original apostles, or at least it tries to. Now, it was not written by them, per se, and some traditions have gone back and said that, well, each of the 12 articles of the Apostles' Creed was written by one of the apostles. Well, that's a nice, it's a nice story, but it's not what happened. Um, this creed was a variation of the old Roman creed from back in 180 AD, and over the course of years it got nuanced and fine-tuned and developed, and it was probably in its final form, at least as we have it today, in about the year 750. But if you just think of that, these creeds that we have, kind of coming back from the year 180 all the way up through the late 500s and, and the mid 700s, and we're still hanging on to them today, some 1,300 years later. They're defining who we are as the people of God. We use the Apostles' Creed in our church in, in liturgy and Many Western Christian denominations do, but certainly not every church uses creeds. The Apostles' Creed is used by Roman Catholics and by Lutherans, by Anglicans, Methodists, Presbyterians, Moravians, um, and many Congregationalists. But you will find in, in many non-denominational churches, they do not use creeds at all, whether that be the Apostles or the Nicene or what have you. They they look at them as being something that is man-made and not Scripture, though we would certainly argue that the words of all of our creeds are grounded in Scripture and faith, and that's how we have come to know God. Um, so as such, you find in churches that don't have creeds, they tend to vary from one place to another in the nuances of their faith and, and what it is that they believe. But for those who do have creeds, it, it's a string that holds them all together, and it, and it kind of keeps people from going too far off one way or the other um, because they can come back down to what is it that we believe. And at our core, our creeds are Trinitarian. That is, they come in three parts. They express how God has come to be become known to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as such, then, we use these creeds at critical times in the church, at baptisms, when we welcome new members, at confirmations, and whenever we need to express collectively what we believe. And, and, and it makes sense for us to do that, because if you were going to be joining a church, let's say, it makes sense that you believe what the rest of the people in that church believe. And what we hold together is how we know God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and the various nuances. So that's a, a lot about creeds, a little bit about the Apostles' Creed, but again, the real core to this is what makes it Lutheran is our understanding. It's in the explanations. So let's take a quick look, and I'm not going to read the explanations for you today, but we will look at each article, and then I will read out of here um, the explanation. I don't have the explanations for the screen simply because I don't have the copyright stuff for that. But 
This is how we introduce the Apostles' Creed in church. When the leader will say, God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. And then what follows is, is what we collectively as a body believe about God. So the first article, the shortest, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Now, obviously, this is talking about God as we know him as the creator, the Father. But Luther asked that question, was is das? What does this mean? So if you have your small catechism with, you can follow along as I read this explanation. What does this mean? I believe that God has created me and all that exists. He has given me and still preserved my body and soul with all their powers. He provides me with food, clothing, home and family, daily work, and all that I need from day to day. God also protects me in time of danger and guards me from every evil. All this he does out of fatherly and divine goodness and mercy, though I do not deserve it. Therefore, I surely have to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. A nice stamp that Luther puts at the end of that explanation. So there's a lot there in that explanation about that very short sentence, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. What is it saying in that stance? Well, for me, the explanation of the first article tells me a couple of really important things. God created, colon, everything. It also tells me that there is a God, and it's not me. And that's hard for us as humans. We want to be God. Even if we don't say it out loud or admit it, we want to be in control, and we want our way, and we want things to go through here. But, but in this explanation, we realize that there is a God who has created everything, and that God is not me. And then this explanation also goes on to say that everything that we have is gift. God has given us all of these things, the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, and they're provided to us even though we have nothing to do with creating them. And then in response to that, I owe and ought to thank and praise God for all that I have and for who God is. That's what this article of the creed is saying to me. If you have some thoughts, please feel free to throw them up on the screen as well. Um, I see we still have more folks jumping in. Hey, Dorothy. Nice to see Dorothy. Karen is here as well. Kind of fun to be church together. Well, let's look now at this second article. The second article, of course, is the longest article. It is about Jesus. And we know more about Jesus, if you will, um, in the New Testament because we have that focus in the Gospels that are about his life and, and what happened to him and what he did. And as, as Christians, Jesus is at the, the heart of our faith. We believe that Jesus is our Savior. In fact, the name Christian comes from the word Christ. We are Christ people. So it makes sense that in the Apostles' Creed, the article about the Son is the longest. Look at that. It covers up my face on the screen here. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. It tells us who Jesus is and kind of walks us through the high points of his life, of course, focusing on the end where he is crucified, but then also raised, where our redemption comes from. And so what does Luther say about this article? If you can follow along with me. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, Son from the Father from eternity, and true man born of the Virgin Mary is my Lord. At great cost, he has saved me and redeemed me, a lost and condemned person. Has it freed me from sin, death, and the power of the devil, not with silver and gold, but with his holy and precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. All this he has done that I might be his own, live under him in his kingdom, 
and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from the dead and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. Again, a lot there, but at the heart of it is, is speaking to the redeeming work of Jesus and what he has done for us. So when I look at this, what do I take away from this second article and this explanation? Well, first, of course, that Jesus is both truly God and truly human. And this has been a source of debate for centuries, and, and there are all kinds of church arguments um, about whether Jesus was really human or not, was he really God or not. Um, but we as Christians believe that Jesus was both truly God and human, especially as Lutheran Christians. This, this explanation also says something personal. It says that Jesus is my Lord. And there's a claim here that this Jesus is Lord of my life. Jesus has saved and redeemed me. And by his suffering and death, Jesus freed me from sin, death, and the power of the devil. So I no longer need to worry about those things, whether I will be saved or not. Because Jesus, true God, true human, is my Lord and has redeemed me. This then frees us to live in his kingdom, in his rule, following his ways. Frees us to reach out and, and to talk and spread his love to others, not worrying about you know, all of these other pieces of life, whether we are going to be getting to heaven or not, per se. Because this Jesus is risen and lives and rules eternally. So that's kind of the, that nutshell takeaway for me in this second article. The third article, of course, would be on the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Two words I want to pay um, draw your attention to there. One, you notice the word Catholic, and that is on the screen. If you look at the beginning of that where it says the Holy Catholic Church, you'll notice it's a small letter C. And that word Catholic um, is often confused with Roman Catholicism, but that's not its use here. Um, that would be a, a capital C, but the small C Catholic means kind of universal, collective. So we believe in the Holy universal church. Well, what does Luther have to say about this article? I believe that I cannot, by my own understanding or effort, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord, or even come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and kept me in true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth, and keeps it united with Jesus Christ in one true faith. In this Christian church, day after day, he fully forgives my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all from the dead and give me and all believers in Christ eternal life. This is most certainly true. A lot there in that explanation on this relatively short article Again, my takeaway, and this is tough for us, this first part, is we believe that we cannot come to God on our own. But the Holy Spirit calls us through the gospel and, and brings us into that relationship. That's why for, for Lutherans, we struggle so much with, with terminology that is so often used by, by other denominations, especially non-denominationals where we talk about, I have decided to follow Jesus and, and some of that imagery. And while there is certainly reference for that in Scripture, um, we understand at our core that God is God and we are not. And all that we have is gift. And even our gift of salvation comes to us through Jesus. And none of this can we do or earn on our own. In fact, we can't even come to know about God if he didn't call to us through the Holy Spirit and invite us into relationship. That's humbling for me. It, it keeps me from maybe getting too big for my britches, as my parents used to say. 
having been called by this Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit then makes the whole Christian church on earth holy. This article of the Creed also reminds us that we are not just our own little group of people within the walls of whatever our own churches are like, but rather we are connected and united to Christians all around the world in other denominations, and even more than that, we're connected to other Christians across time and space. And we have that connection and have been made holy with those who have gone before us, as well as those who will come after us. And that daily, in the midst of this, Jesus forgives our sins, and this Holy Spirit will then raise us to eternal life on the last day. Again, there's a lot in there, um, but it's so comforting to me, as, as I look at Luther's explanation, that there is a God out there who is seeking after me, and calling me through the gospel, and working through other people, that I might hear this message, that I might be invited into relationship. And that as that happens, I am connected to all of these other people, and together we are empowered then to go about sharing this good news of Jesus, that they too might know daily forgiveness of sin, and the freedom that comes with that. So in this creed, we come to understand God as Father and the Creator, Jesus the Son and the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, the Sanctifier, who works with us every day. I think as Lutherans, we have lacked in our focus on this third article. And maybe it's, it's through time. I've heard some say that the first thousand years of life, people really focused on God the Father. And then the next 2,000 years of, of our existence, or at least since the time of Jesus, focused on Jesus. But maybe now as we're coming into the 2000s, churches are focusing, see you Jonah, focusing more on the Holy Spirit and, and what that might mean. And we certainly have seen um, the Holy Spirit acting in, in ways now, even just in the world during this pandemic. And, and that's Spirit of God sanctifying and unifying and, and working through us. So... In my own walk of faith, while Christians by their nature are very Christocentric, or we focus on this person of Jesus, I look forward to thinking about how the church is going to be transformed in the years to come um, as, as we think more and more about the Holy Spirit. Any thoughts from you guys? We keep having people who have joined, but um, I don't see that we've got a very many questions coming through but boy is it sure nice to see all the people who are here and, and who are paying attention i think with that being said we will draw this to a close with luther's evening prayer we give thanks to you heavenly father through jesus christ your dear son that you have this day so graciously protected us we beg you to forgive us all our sins and the wrong which we have done by your great mercy, defend us from the perils and dangers of this night. Into your hands we commend our bodies and souls and all that is ours. Let your holy angels have charge of us, that the wicked one may have no power over us. Amen. And that word, amen, means yea, yea, let it be so. We are confirming that everything that we have said is true proclaiming that it is something that we believe. And so with that, I again thank you guys for joining us. I bid you a wonderful evening. May you have a great night, and may God bless you. This is most certainly true.